It is a pleasure to introduce our next instructor based in the greater Los Angeles area. Matthew Peterson is the managing partner of Peterson Capital Management. Matt has over a decade of experience with global financial services firms, including Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, American Express, and Ameriprise Financial. Prior to forming Peterson Capital Management and launching Peterson Investment Fund, Matt split time between Wall Street and London as Capital Markets Manager in the Financial Services Vertical at Diamond Management and Technology Consultants. During his tenure with Diamond, Matt worked with top-tier investment banks, global payments firms, and international insurance companies to deliver high impact solutions to his clients most challenging business problems and matt on behalf of the moi global membership community a very warm welcome please go ahead thank you john it's a pleasure to be back here with uh, the best ideas conference and uh i look forward to a a, a wonderful session uh <clears throat> this year I'd like to bring to everyone's attention a very unique uh, public company, uh, something that has hidden assets and some very low and low interest debt that is quite unique. It has, it's run by exceptional capital allocators uh, with a subsidiary that has gone very much undetected uh, and is actually significantly larger than the traditional business. I think many investors are aware of the business and they're simply overlooking something that's right in front of them. And that business is the Daily Journal Corporation. The uh, chairman of the board is Charlie Munger. So today I will walk through uh, a brief overview of the corporation. We can look at the different pieces that uh, build this company today. Uh, I will walk through Journal Technologies, which is this very special subsidiary. Uh, we can review a scuttlebutt analysis of the firm and then a brief summary. So first, this is a, uh, these are my attorneys saying hello. And then we can jump into the Daily Journal Corporation. Uh, this is an American publishing and technology company. In fact, uh, you know, the original paper began in 1888, so it's quite an old business. And uh, current management took over in 1977. But what this is today is a totally misunderstood and hidden business model. There are zero analysts. There is no investor relations. It is a very, it is very much a black box. Um, there is significant off financial statement value. There are actually projects that are going on where they have completely deferred the revenue. So the revenue is nowhere on the financial statements. And they're of course accelerating the costs associated with this revenue. And so there is a complete uh, distortion of the, of the financial statements. Uh, it is, when you put the numbers in properly, it is undervalued on both a Graham and a Fisher, from a Graham and Fisher perspective, and it is a micro cap compounder in a huge space. So there is, uh, of course, it is run by an extraordinarily high quality board and management team. So <clears throat> briefly, I'll walk through a bit of background and uh, first of all, the board members up on top, many of you will be very familiar with. These are each in their own right, exceptional individuals. Kaufman is the author, of course, of, of Poor Charlie's Almanac and, uh, and also runs Glen Eyre in uh, California. Rick Gurin is, a, uh, is one of the original super investors that was written about by Warren Buffett back in 1984 in uh, the super investments, super investors of, of Graham and Doddsville. Uh, Charlie Munger uh, doesn't need much of an introduction, but he's been, you know, uh, Warren's partner for uh, over five decades. Jerry Salzman has held the C-suite positions of this firm for three decades. And uh, Wilcox is uh, 
is a very established biologist on the board and running many different uh, uh, firms in the area. So also a brief timeline here might be useful. So again, Gurren and Munger bought this newspaper in 1977 and then through acquisitions and organic growth they grew this into a uh, very prominent paper in california and arizona it actually consists of 10 separate papers with a very wide circulation a very focused um, niche group which is um you know attorneys and um they've been running this very successfully for uh over 40 years but obviously, the newspaper business, which is what everyone affiliates the firm with, is in a very cyclical decline. And so that's been reflected, I think, over the course of um, <clears throat> the last uh, decade or so, as people have, are not as interested in, in participating in that sector. So in 2009, uh, and actually, I will point out that they have a small um, one small gem inside this newspaper business, and it is a it is a uh, public public notification brokerage business. And what that means is when there is an estate uh, in the, in the event of an estate sale or a foreclosure uh, due to bankruptcy or otherwise, there by law it requires uh, public notification in a prominent um, newspaper. And so, they run this brokerage business and in 2009 and during oftentimes during uh, recessionary periods, this is a counter cyclical aspect of the firm and they have a large inflow of cash. Uh, so as foreclosures occur, their, their basically public notification revenue increases substantially. And uh, rumor is over a bridge game, Munger and Gurin essentially bottom ticked the market. So they took about 50 million in cash and they bought uh, uh, a, a very concentrated portfolio of assets, primarily in the financial sector, but they bought you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, US Bank, a little bit of POSCO. They own two foreign securities we believe to be BYD and Hyundai. Uh, and so in 2009, they, they took cash and they bought an equity portfolio. And that equity portfolio performed extremely well, and they still hold essentially the same exact equity portfolio. In 2012 and 13, they did something interesting, and they they borrowed margin from their equity portfolio. Uh, it's at a 50 bit premium to the Fed funds rate. They pay a 2.5 percent rate, interest only, non callable on that debt. Uh, they borrowed 30 million. They pieced together a couple of technology firms, and they took a very much venture capital approach to pivoting their business into a into a software into a SaaS business model that would service government court and agencies across the nation and around the world and this was very much done in a hidden fashion it looked a little peculiar even to the accountants uh these uh the probability of success, even as Munger spoke about it, was low, although the tide has turned and now they are becoming quite successful. So by 2019 here, uh, they are becoming an important software as a service provider in a very large niche space. And below, I just want to point out that, you know, this has already been a hundred bagger. Uh, it's been 150 bagger. It's now has a market cap of 300 million. Uh, it has had very solid double-digit returns uh, for 42 years. Uh, so what are the core components of the Daily Journal? So there's the newspaper business, which is the traditional business that consists of the 10 papers and this sort of public notification subsidiary. <clears throat> and that's fine, but it's in a cyclical downturn, as we know. There is the investment portfolio that's become very large, long-term equity holdings, cash, and a bit of real estate in the, in the form of their corporate offices. And we can um, also you know, put some debt against that portfolio. And then there's this technology business. And uh, this is the business we should be focused on because this is the future of the company. And as Munger said here in, 2017, 
this software business, if it works, will spread over the whole country. And we have a lot of business now spread over the whole country. So I think the easiest way to break this down is to look at a sum of the parts analysis and figure out what we know and don't know. So right off the bat, the newspapers are worth something. And certainly the counter cyclicality of the public notification business is worth something. Uh, but for ease of evaluation, I think we can just put it to zero. Uh, the investment portfolio, again, I'll highlight, it's run by a couple of the remaining super investors in this world. And surprisingly, the same portfolio that these two built and have left unchanged since 2009, Buffett and Munger and Berkshire Hathaway allocated a large pool of capital at the end of 2018 to essentially much the same the same positions, certainly within the financial sector. Uh, and the portfolio itself is an interesting component. This is not a mini Berkshire Hathaway. This is not, uh, you know, some sort of personal hedge fund for, for Munger and Gerwin. What it does is the size of this portfolio gives them sufficient weight to bid on statewide technology solutions. If they were if they were actually a nano cap operating this space, I, I think it would be more difficult. I'm I'm sure it would be much more difficult for uh for an entire state to say trust them with the software solutions for running the government. Uh, the, so the portfolio provides a couple of advantages, including the size advantage. Uh, let's jump over to the valuation column in the investment portfolio. And I'll just show you as of uh, the, you know, as of the very end of 2018, fiscal year 2018, they have 9 million cash. And this is done uh, actually with some December lows of the stock market. So. 9 million in cash, 188 million in common stock, again listed here as Wells Fargo, Bank of America, US Bank, P, uh, POSCO, and what we believe to be Hyundai and BYD, six positions, and uh, three of them make up pretty much the entire portfolio, and then 16 million in uh, their real estate. So if we look at a net investment portfolio, it's interesting to look at this debt. I, I often think that debt should be treated somewhat differently because debt can come in such different forms. And this is some of the most exceptional debt, uh, I think, at any public company. So the first piece is they have 30 million in non-maturing margin loans at a 2.5% interest rate. It's basically below inflation. And uh, and because it's non-maturing, they can actually hold that uh, indefinitely. Then they have 40 million in a deferred capital gains tax, which is essentially a form of float. And of course, the tax is at zero percent. And of course, if they continue to maintain this exact same portfolio for decades and decades, they actually never have to pay this liability. And then finally, they have a $2 million mortgage, a very small mortgage on one of their offices uh, at 4.66%. And so ultimately, this is a, uh, I think, very, uh, very reasonable form of debt. Uh, the average cost of debt far below the cost of the, the rate of inflation, and most of it being non-maturing may never uh, or at least not be paid back for a very long time until it's a very strategic situation. However, for ease of the evaluation, let's subtract it all from the investment portfolio and look at this as being a net investment portfolio of 141 million. So that brings us to the hidden piece, journal technologies. And journal technologies is truly very difficult to uh, get information on. It, it took actually, uh, I've done the work for you, but it took a lot of work to get an understanding of this. Uh, it's, it's 
there there are no public disclosures about it. Uh, you can read about it once a year in the annual report, and there's a few comments about it, and Munger speaks about it uh, very briefly at the Daily Journal annual meeting. Those are essentially the only resources unless you go into scuttlebutt mode. Uh, but this is, in fact, the future of the Daily Journal Co. business. Uh, there is off financial statement value in terms of hidden revenue. They have built in significant moats. Their competitors are mostly fragmented competitors. It's an enormous space. They have an exceptional board and it's going to build, they are building a very high margin SaaS business model with extremely sticky recurring revenues. Uh, so this basically puts in a situation where the financial figures and the statements aren't accurate, the costs are inflated, the revenues deferred, uh, but we found a path to 150 million in revenue over the next decade with very high margins. And Munger in 2016, when speaking about journal technology said, I only wish our prospects were as good as BYDs, and by the way, they might be. So what is, what is, uh, journal technologies. So at, in its present form, journal technologies is a case management system and it allows courthouses, public defenders, prosecutors, and all of the affiliated agencies to access relevant data within the justice system. And they are essentially creating efficiencies in the system. They're actually saving taxpayer money by building a system and implementing these upgrades that are much more effective uh, for, for these courthouses and agencies. So if you've been in a courthouse uh, any time over the last decade, you've seen how much paperwork is there. They have entire rooms allocated to storage. There's very little um, digital technology taking place. If you checked in somewhere, you might have seen somebody even with a green screen that was typing. I mean, it is very, very, they're using legacy software, legacy systems. They're actually very slow to change. It's very bureaucratic. It's hard to, uh, it's very slow and it is difficult. And Munger explains how difficult it has been. Uh, but through through the combination of these firms, they have been making some significant progress. So journal technologies, number one, and, uh, and one of their moats is this deferred gratification ethos. So because of, I think, their very special, uh, their very special shareholder base, as well as their very special uh, uh, knowledge of human nature, they have approached this from a very different way. And they go in to these courthouses that abs absolutely need a system upgrade. And they basically do the implementation all up front for no cost, no payment until the implementation is complete. So what that means is there is an RFP process that can take four years. The RFP goes out, different competitors bid, and Daily Journal comes back and says, we will do the entire implementation and you don't pay us until you are satisfied at the end. And that reduces the risk for these courthouses and agencies significantly. A comp no other competitor can defer their revenue uh, in this way. And so Daily Journal is winning a significant amount of contracts, not only because they honestly have the best product, but because they actually are uh, wealthy enough that they're treating their customers uh, better. And so they go in and they do an RFP that might take six months to a year. The implementation then takes a year and a half or more. And by the time they start actually billing for the services, uh, it can be up, it can be four years and even beyond. So here is a contract. You will not see this revenue in the income statement. Uh, you will see the costs, of course, because they are doing implementation from their, uh, they are, they're building out this implementation through journal technologies, but you will not see any revenue. And the, uh, the contracts, though, can be found if you go through uh, every county and state level searching public tax budgeting documentation. And what you will find is that because they're spending taxpayer money on the services, 
you can begin to get a picture of who is paying what and when to journal technologies. So here is just a basic contract extension. They have won the city of Austin. Austin's paying them a million for the initial implementation, and then we'll be paying them annually uh, for the next 10 years at a, a steadily inflating price on a license per license basis. So this is something that began in uh, 2017 as a contract. However, the RFP was in 2016. This implementation is not scheduled to complete until 2019, upon which if it is approved, um, they will start to get the first million in revenue. So Monger uh, in 2017 said, you can't look at our financial statements and make very good judgment about what's going to happen. So we have uncovered over a hundred contracts. Many of them have incomplete implementation, which means they're deferring the revenue. And here is a shortcut to 20 of them. If you want to go and look these up, you can go to, uh, quickly, you can go to Orange County, search through the tax filings and get an understanding that they are owed about 550 million for 550,000, excuse me, for an implementation. And then we'll have 300,000 recurring revenue uh, moving forward with a built in inflation rate. Uh, they have also, for example, um, won uh, the Los Angeles courthouse, which is quite large. They have also taken Southern Australia, which is um, somewhat surprising to people, even Munger himself. So Salzman CEO says, we have a large number of installations going on. Most will take upwards of a year, some much longer. And again, the takeaway is that revenue is not on the financial statement at all. So what is happening if you combine the future expected revenue is that they are building a billion dollar business. This is a multi-channel revenue expansion that's happening. These contracts typically last for 10 years with built-in price increases, often at 5%. And in a conversation with one courthouse, we learned that after the 10 years expires, not only do they expect to sign up for another 10 years, but they anticipate a much higher jump in prices. And that's pretty uh, remarkable that they are basically going to sign up uh, regardless of the price increase that takes place. Uh, and as you get to understand the, the software that's being provided and how much the system starts to rely on that software, you start to recognize how sticky this revenue becomes. It will actually be extremely difficult to change away from uh, the software once, once it's embedded. And it's also, frankly, the best software. And so you're stuck with the best, which isn't a problem. Uh, the other number two is that additional licenses from existing clients are happening at a very rapid rate. And what I mean is a, a client from uh, uh, New Mexico that I was speaking with explained to me that they had originally done a, uh, a multi-year implementation and purchased uh, 105 licenses for about 100,000 US dollars uh, per year. Uh, and after year one, they were so pleased with the software and the license are assigned to a single individual. They actually were increasing their license count from 105 to over 250. So additional licenses are in high demand once this software is implemented and being used. Next, there are new licenses and implementation. So uh, this, this refers to two things. One is if a courthouse and a couple of agencies are using the software, it becomes a very seamless way for them to all communicate with, the, with one another. That is a judge that may be trying a case, may wanna see a previous precedent, and with a few clicks of the button can look through all sorts of casework right there on his iPad, maybe sitting on the bench. Uh, if, uh, if these outside uh, agencies, they don't always sign up uh, for the initial implementation. In fact, a lot of times they don't sign up and it starts with the courthouse. But after 
uh, the implementation is complete, they start recognizing the value, and they get demand for new implementations with the associated agencies. And there are a lot of associated agencies. Furthermore, there's, of course, an excellent sales team that's out there filing for new RFPs, putting out new proposals, and capturing new counties, states, and in the case of Southern Australia, um, significant parts of countries. Finally, part four could be a significant piece of the pie. However, uh, for this analysis, we've essentially left it off. There is consulting work. So an existing courthouse employee may be uh, uh, needing to get some various reporting completed and may have a question. And of course, they can call uh, for help with journal technologies. Uh, they charge uh, a fair amount for assistance, but they're more than happy to help. And uh, there is a, a consult that's you know part of the consulting fees. And as you have these implemented in more and more courts and agencies around the country and world, the consulting fees can actually grow to a pretty substantial rate. And then there's something called these public services. So public services include right now a software called ePayIt it and ePile it. ePayIt is, uh, you know, for any tickets or violations. So if you have a speeding ticket and you don't want to uh, find a check and lick a stamp, uh, you can actually pay it online, but there needs to be a system where you can pay that online and you can go to ePay it and pay it online. So for any of the courthouses uh, affiliated with the journal technology software, they will have ePay it and uh, the public can go in and for a small fee, I don't know if it's three or four dollars, they can pay their fee with a card through um, through their PC. Uh, E-file it is more of an internal system where uh, where on a per page basis, they are able to upload documents to the docket. And uh, some of the cases will have many thousands of pages and um, it will be uh, the easiest and simplest way to upload things. So these ePay it and ePile it can actually um, bring in substantial revenue and very high margin revenue uh, down the road. So. At a high level, these are these are four channels where revenue is expanding very rapidly. And again, today, almost none of this is on the financial statements. So revenue is going to jump rapidly in coming years as implementations are complete and large invoices are paid. Uh, we expect to see 150 million in avenue in annual revenue conservatively from the JTI subsidiary within 10 years and sustainable margins likely above 25%. And the uh, competition, you know, the 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 800 pound gorilla uh, targets 35 percent. So the numbers are conservative here. JTI, with less than a 20x earnings multiple, will have a 700 million dollar market cap uh, compared with 160 approximately today, uh, based on um, removal of the investment portfolio from the current market cap of 300 million, and the uh, Net equity portfolio with you know conservative single digit growth over uh, a decade can be worth 400 million. Um, and I also want to point out here that this investment portfolio very much protects the downside. I think we have a very asymmetric upside in this position and a very, very protected downside. This investment portfolio, uh, which remains unchanged and will likely remain unchanged, is um, just a steadily growing. Uh, this is, again, not in, meant in any way to be a, a monger hedge fund, but it limits the downside uh, because the, the equity portfolio itself is already 212 million minus the liabilities and the whole market cap is only 300 million. So today, the market cap of 300 million can deliver two to three X returns over a decade, which delivers an IRR of 15% annually. And this growth can actually continue for decades. So in 2017, again, Munger says every contract that is significant is a major jump. This business is so big, their whole states. I mean, this is a huge business. So as we approach the end of these slides, 
I want to quickly jump through a, a few of these scuttlebutt points. Uh, you know, Phil Fisher has 15 points that he likes or he liked to look at and wrote about uh, in common stocks and uncommon profit. And uh, if you look through these, it is very rare to find a business that satisfies all of these, uh, that satisfies, you know, each of these points. And and by the way, I don't think that daily journal companies set out to create a business, and this is really a focus on, on journal technology. So I don't think journal technology set out to create a business that satisfied scuttlebutt. I think that management knows how to build an exceptional business, and scuttlebutt is designed to identify those companies. And, uh, you know, I actually I will I will add this at this point. If you need a little refresher on Scuttlebutt, you can Google Peterson Capital Management and Scuttlebutt and see a short uh, illustrated video uh, I put together that summarizes these points. So I don't need to read them all for you, but you know you can just imagine: Does this firm have a large market for sizable sale increases? Absolutely. It's it's you know is there determination for new product development? It's they are currently developing new products. And Munger has talked about when they saturate this market, which they won't do for a long time, they can move into uh, adoption agencies. And there's other agencies that they can expand into very easily. Uh, you know, number five is asking about a worthwhile profit margin. Of, this is a SaaS model with an exceptional profit margin. So it's surprising how, how high the bar is and how much they surpass the bar in so many of these. I will point out a couple of the questionable items. Number seven, for example, says excellent labor and personnel relations. And I will share that on glassdoor.com, it shows quite a few complaints around things like micromanagement, flat organization, low pay, poor quality facilities, no 401k. It's it's actually surprising. It's surprising to me. I'm wondering if they're going to change um, these things and if this is a result of this sort of inorganic uh, M&A activity. Uh, but these complaints are a cause for concern. I mean, management is praising their employees, uh, but you know the the complaints are there online so um so certainly this is a, a questionable point uh, a couple of these i have put in orange um so they're somewhat questionable outstanding executive relations so it's interesting here but you know the board members are of top quality however they it is no secret that this is an, an older bunch of gentlemen and frankly they've been running the firm for decades without a whole lot of key executives lined up for replacement as far as we know. So this is questionable. I, I, I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they've put together 350 employees, basically hand selected them over uh, 42 years. So I would think that they have some, um, you know, some, some good uh, executive relations and into nine, some depth of management, but we just don't know. And um, so that's why they're here in orange. So again, uh, I will point out that they also, uh, one, one common theme is that this board of directors, uh, you know, self-proclaims a lack of technology experience. And here they are launching into a, a venture business uh, in the technology space. So certainly uh, these are a couple of the risks associated with this scuttlebutt analysis. Uh, you know, then it jumps right back into some excellent ones. Number 12, long-term versus short-term profit outlook. I mean, I've never seen anything like it, pushing these revenues out for half a decade uh, and taking all the costs up front. And, um, it, you know, but number 14 uh, is frankness regarding negative developments. And we'll, I will say Munger has been somewhat uh, open about expressing the risks. Uh, I am not there, there it, it is as much of a black box as it could be, and I it's run like a private company, and I am not convinced that we would learn if there was uh, if there were revenues uh, that were not being paid, or if they were declining, or if the sales team was being unsuccessful, or if there were technology issues. I'm not sure how that information would come forward. It would probably require uh, digging into. Uh, 
you know, the cost associated with the implementations and seeing big changes in the costs. Uh, but that is, again, a question. And then, of course, 15, management of unquestionable integrity. And, of course, the answer is unequivocally yes. So Phil Fisher here in 1996 wrote, a company could well be an investment bonanza if it failed to fully qualify on a very few of them. And I do believe that Daily Journal qualifies um, for, for that definition. Okay, so uh, in summary, just a quick overview. Uh, this is a $30 million market cap with an investment portfolio, newspaper business, and uh, and a technology piece. There's about 1.3 million shares outstanding. That remains unchanged. There's no dilution going on. It's uh, it's 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 run in a very uh, their excellent capital allocators run a very uh, effective manner. The average daily volume is quite small, 1,100 shares, which is about 250 thousand dollars. Which means a lot of larger funds are unable to get a sizable enough position to participate even if they want to. So this is a uh, very special case where there's a huge opportunity uh, for uh, funds of say sub 100 million AUM. There is a net investment portfolio of 140 million. The present value of the JTI value discounted back at 10% is 250 million, putting the entire value if we drop newspaper to zero, put consulting at zero, and put public services at zero, which of course is all wrong and all underestimated, uh, this puts the current value at about 390 million. So what that leaves us with is something decent, but not uh, not an overly huge um, gram assessment, where we say the conservative some of the parts reveals that there's about 30% upside. But what we see through the scuttlebutt and the qualitative aspects is that the internal qualitative incentives and the moats and the invariant strategies that reveal these hidden, they reveal all these hidden upside, uh, you know, potential call options that you're picking up within this firm. And the long-term compounding nature of this is that it will outperform the markets for a decade or longer, I think for many decades ahead. And with that, John, I will turn it back to you for any questions. Well, Matt, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting presentation. Maybe we could just start um, a little bit with the management or, or go back to that. How who runs the technologies business and is that management team different from the daily journal management team that's a very good question so salzman is in fact uh he wears all of the c-suite hats it is a very unique structure it's very strange it sounds in fact, alarming. Salzman is the CEO, the CFO, he's the treasurer, he's the secretary. It is like something you've never seen before. By the way, this gentleman is also 80 years old. So uh, in fact, I think he may be older than 80 now. Uh, so he is in effect the CEO of Journal Technologies as well. Uh, and in fact, if you go to uh, if you go to glassdoor.com. Now, by the way, Salzman's an amazing individual, so I don't want to uh, say anything uh, that sounds too negative. But I will say that if you go to glassdoor.com, you will see uh, employees complain about the CEO who has no experience in technology and no uh, view on it. And I can absolutely understand why they would have that perspective because it's absolutely true. Now, underneath Salzman is uh, the COO, John Peak, And John Peak is actually an exceptional leader. And he's grown up through New Dawn and stayed with the company for uh, well over a decade. And, uh, and so he is really on the ground running things. Uh, he is in charge of, uh, he's the COO. Uh, so he has uh, more of a technology background, started in the technology space and was acquired by Daily Journal. 
So these, uh, you know, the, the fact is that the, and this is part of the black box phenomenon, it is very difficult to find out not only it's hard enough to find out what the software is, where it exists, who's buying it, how it's being paid for, when it's being paid for. And it's and there's absolutely no public information about the team members affiliated with the various components. Uh, I actually uh, had an opportunity to meet John Peak, and um, which is how I found out about his existence. Otherwise, um, it would be it would be a total black box. That's helpful. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you did an impressive amount of scuttlebutt here. Uh, thank you for sharing that, by the way. Um, how could we or anyone who would like to track this uh, idea over time what would be the data points we should keep an eye on to gauge the progress of the technologies piece? And uh, what would be the key data sources to, um, to have? That is a great question. Uh, and in fact, we are evaluating that internally on a regular basis. So what we have concluded at this point is, um, first of all, the main, the main source of information is going to be sec.gov going to the 10k and 10q filings and watching very closely the revenue and costs associated with the jti breakout of this business and we have uh internal models where we believe the numbers will will be and so we're looking to see how closely things are tracking uh another uh very good primary source but a very difficult and time consuming source is to continuously be searching. Uh, and, and when I say searching, it's, it's the old, it's the old fashioned Google search, if you can say that today. Uh, and it's looking through the public filings with counties across the nation to determine if they have one new RFP contracts. And then those contracts will actually list out the amount of revenue upon completion. So you can anticipate a new contract being sold today might have a $2 million implementation that they will receive in 2023. And you can update your model and then you can watch for that revenue as that time approaches. But right now, the best source is to either uh, read the transcripts and watch um, or attend the Daily Journal annual meeting or to look directly at the SEC website. And again, the revenue uh, will be increasing, uh, uh, I think, at very high rates over the next couple of years. And um, the cost should be increasing at a very, very uh, uh, substantially lower rate than the revenue. And those are the two figures I would watch. You can also, in the breakout, see revenues from public services, which is ePay it and eFile it. And you might see those start to jump if the public starts using the software as well. Matt, you mentioned that uh, the company is not covered by any analysts. Uh, that said, the people who go to the Daily Journal annual meeting and uh, more broadly, uh, value investors or, or Berkshire Hathaway uh, acolytes um, certainly know of the company. Um, could you just comment a little bit on the level of questions uh, that that have been, you know, made at during those annual meetings? I mean, are the, you know, the Berkshire followers aware of the significance of this um, opportunity, particularly the technologies piece, and maybe just reflect on. Um, how unique the scuttlebutt analysis you have done is and whether that's been done at all uh, previously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my perception is, and I may be wrong, but I've spoken to quite a few individuals and been attending daily journal meetings for, I think, eight years. My perception is 
uh, that those in attendance, including myself, originated and are still today often Charlie Munger groupies. And they are in attendance because they want to see this uh, investment genius speak. And they want a chance to maybe ask a question. And the questions range from how to run a government to how to raise your children. And there are, it's similar to the Berkshire Hathaway meetings before the analysts were introduced, the questions are so wide that it is actually rare for there to be any question on Daily Journal specifically. And it is even more rare to find information uh, on JTI. So this, remember, was a business that was pieced together in 2012 and 13. And so in 2014, it sort of was the first time that the combination and JTI even existed. So in 2015, 16, 17, and 18, you can certainly go and review the transcripts. They're worthwhile even if you're not interested in JTI. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a, a lot of wisdom packed into um, a two-hour transcript. However, uh, you will find that there are probably uh, two to three questions uh, in any given uh, year on journal technology and frankly, that is where I'm getting a great deal of these quotes, where he's saying uh, this business, uh, you know, and I will actually go further and I will tell you a, a few of the analogies he used. Four, four years ago, John, uh, Munger was describing this as a venture business, saying for all you Ben Graham groupies out there, uh, I'm not saying it won't work, but if it does, you don't deserve it. He was talking about how it's uh, a few 90-year-olds with one eye and one arm and one leg trying to climb Mount Everest, and we're at the very bottom, and uh, you know the chance of success is almost nothing. Uh, so, and he was really deterring people from participating. That has now changed, and these subtle words I pay a lot of attention to, and I, I think they're done purposefully. Um, he's now talks about how they've made it across the river, but they would never do this again. It was too difficult. They've talked about how they got to the summit uh, and they can't believe it themselves. Last year, uh, he, he went on and said, if you told me 20 years ago we'd be running the justice system of Australia, I think you were crazy. And here we are. So uh, he has now turned from being a very cautious uh, speaker in the few times he does speak about it to being almost proud of the success that they've had. And um, I, I will add, he is he doesn't like to speak negatively about his competitors, but the, the main uh, one in the room is uh, Tyler Technologies. And he has said things like, um, I wish all of my competitors were like Tyler Technologies. Thank you, Matt. That's very helpful. Um, I'll leave it there. I would just encourage our members to feel free to follow up with you uh, with their own thoughts and questions. Uh, of course, we're happy to facilitate an introduction as well. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to share this uh, fascinating analysis in this forum. We truly appreciate it. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure as always. Goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.